Since we've taken a look at how Destination Nat works in the previous video and all that good stuff that goes along with it, that is typically not going to be how organizations are going to want to expose their internal web traffic and things like that. So typically speaking, you're not going to do Destination Nat for a web server like that, or at least a one-to-one -one mapping. It just doesn't make sense. So what we're going to take a look at in this video is the load balancing capability of an NSX Edge. So I've got this VM right here, VM1, well, 172.29.1.15 and 1.16, right? So these are both IIS servers that are, or Windows Server 2012 that's got the IIS capability turned on. So we have web services enabled. What I'm gonna go do is I'm going to leave the destination NAT option in place. So if we were to come back over here, and log, or I'm sorry, the source net, not the destination net, source net. If we were to come in here and look at the connectivity here, we should still have internet access from the inside out. Give that a couple seconds to respond. If I hit the up arrow on this guy, we should have internet access, which we do, which is what we want to have. So I have internet access from my inside network to my outside network. But what I want to do is I want to get rid of the destination NAT that I set up in the previous video. So I'm going to go to Networking and Security, NSX Edges. I'm going to click on the ESG. I'm going to come over to NAT. And I'm going to get rid of the destination NAT. I'm going to go ahead and just delete that rule. Go ahead and click on Delete That. And then we're going to go ahead and Publish. All right. So everybody's happy there. So now that that's been done, I no longer will have the ability of pointing towards my a single IP address to reach a single server on the inside. What I will be doing is taking a look at uh, load balancing. And load balancing is the ability of taking a single IP address and using that as a pointer to all of your hosts, whether it's a DNS lookup or a you're pointing to a specific IP. And then on top of that, the load balancer is then going to as the name implies, balance the load of connections that are coming in. Let me go ahead and take a look at this. Come over here to load balancer capability. Right now we see that it is currently disabled. Now there's a lot of features and capabilities we're gonna take a look at in, throughout this section. So I'm gonna show you a basic deployment and talk a little bit about each thing as we're going through just the, the singular capability. Before I really get into the config, let's talk about the two major types of load balancer capabilities. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about this from a, a left to right perspective. So here we have the, the client. And then we're going to have the edge services gateway. And our direction of traffic for both of my explanations is going to be left to right. So the client points to the edge services gateway. And then the ESG has the, we'll put the load balancer service turned on, set up and configured. And then we're going to connect down this way to a DLR, which is going to have a logical switch connected to it. And you're going to have um, server one and server two. When the flow is going this direction and it hits the, I'm sorry, when it hits the, the ESG, you're going to, an IP address that the ESG is advertising, the ESG's load balancer service is then going to go ahead and open up connections to each one of the servers on behalf of the client. Because you could have like 20 or more clients. And I'm not starting off at 20 just because that's the minimum. It's you can have one client or you can have 200,000 clients, right? And that's really the, the benefit here is you're able to load balance this as far as you go. So if you need to add more servers, you create SR3 and you create you know SR4 and go on from there this can scale, where you just add more members to the pool and it scales up. This is what they refer to as inline load balancing because the data flow is in, in line. The other option for this, which is actually the more common way of doing it, is you do the edge services gateway like you have here. And then what you do is you create another edge services gateway that is also on a similar uh, logical switch and what you end up doing is you 
put the load balancer surface not on. Oh, let me actually let me back this up a little bit. You take some of the stuff back. So you don't configure the load balancer surface on this edge of services gateway. You configure it on another one here. Remember this is inline. Down here you can cre you create it and then the load balancer service is turned on here. Traffic is pointed to this guy and then this guy opens up connections to the servers right here. So and this is what they refer to as one armed load balancer. And we're going to be taking a look at both and then we're going to get into more of the specifics of how each one does things and stuff like that. So it's not a very complicated topic. Now, I know the question's probably coming up in your mind. Well, Rob, why don't they just use an F5 load balancer or some other type of load balancing, you know, some other hardware-based load balancer? And the answer to that question is they probably would. But in this case here, I have the ability of deploying load balancing services inside of the ESG in my environment, which means I don't need a physical box to do it. But in most cases, you are. So to do the inline load balancing, the first thing we're going to have to go through, go through and do is we're going to have to click on edit here underneath ESG, load balancer, global configuration, and then edit. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on the, the feature. Now this next one here, the acceleration. Acceleration means I am going to do layer four load balancing. I'm going to load balance based off of the layer four information. The, how many different flows are coming inbound to me. And I can take a look at that as we're going forward. I'm actually going to turn acceleration on because when you turn acceleration on, it actually disables layer seven or HGTB based flows, or you know the, uh, the layer seven load balancing. When you turn acceleration on, that is basically what you're trying to accomplish. Now, in most cases, it's depending on the deployment will determine what type of load balancing mechanism I'm going to use. It's just easier to demonstrate when I've got layer seven turned off and I've enabling layer four because then I can come over here and do a show service and then load balancer and then I can say session and L4 and I can see how many sessions are coming through. And this is what we're going to go take a look at. So that's that. So we're now we've enabled layer uh, layer four load balancing. The next thing I have to go do is come down to the application profile. The application profile, I'm gonna click on him. I'm gonna go ahead and add an app profile. And I'm gonna match this based off of TCP. I'm gonna call this the uh, TCP app dash profile. The persistence, I'm not going to have any specific persistence here. We'll talk about that at a different point in time. I'm going to go ahead and click on add. And we're going to go ahead and go through this. So now that's been added. The next one I'm going to go do is we're going to take a look at service monitoring. Now there's a couple different service monitors here. This is an, an, an optional add-on. I'm actually not going to demo this in this particular video because I want to just do a basic load balancing example of how this would work and then we'll tie in in service monitoring at a later point in time because this will, depending on how we configure it and all that good stuff, will determine how it'll operate. So basically, at just a, a 30 second explanation on service monitoring, you are sending a an application level message from the load balancer down to the member server that's in the service pool or in the pool of servers that are going to be able to handle requests and you're saying hey server one is your web service running yes or no and then same thing with server two server three server four if something happens and you get a negative response meaning that the service is not responding you're no longer going to forward traffic to that particular member in the pool so it's a way to take a look at is the service working? I'm gonna go jump over here to pools. And if I'm gonna in the pool, I need to create a pool. The pool I'm gonna call, this is gonna be the uh, inline inline LB pool. 
and it's gonna the algorithm is gonna be round robin. There's a bunch of these, and I'll talk about these more in detail at a later point in time. I could associate a monitor if I wanted to, and I'm gonna go ahead and click on add. Now, now that's been added. There's no members here, right? I have to go ahead and add members to it. Right now, it's like, well, there are no members. That's because I have to go in here and edit the members. And the first member I'm going to go ahead and add. I'm going to click on Add here. And the name is going to be uh, SRV1. The IP address is going to be 172.29.1. I believe it's 15. The state is going to be enabled. The port that I'm going to be matching on is port 80. The monitor port is going to be 80. The weight is going to be 1 which means it's you know obviously the lowest weighting you can have and then I can have set of minimum and a maximum connections if I wanted to I could also if I had a, a security group that's being tied to this I could use that if I wanted to I'm just going to click on OK and I'm going to add server 2 so SRV2 and the IP address will be 172.29.1.16 the state is going to be enable obviously port is going to be 80, monitor port is going to be 80, weight is going to be 1, so they're going to be equally used. I'm going to click on save. Then you're going to see a couple of members are going to be showing up here. If we click on this, it'll show me that there are two set up. Perfect. The next thing I'm going to do is go down to virtual servers. And this is where you're tying everything together and actually making your load balancer a thing. I'm going to click on add. And then virtual server is going to be enabled. I'm going to turn acceleration on. I'm going to use the TCP app profile, which is what I created earlier. That's the only one that's available. I'm going to call this guy here the uh, inline LB pool. And I'm going to call the addresses. I'm going to select the IP address. And it's the IP address that I'm going to associate. And I have to associate this to the uplink, which is going to be 10.00.2. .0 so that's going to be the IP address that I point towards. And then I have a default pool of inline load balancer pool. So just to recap, I've got virtual server turned on, acceleration is turned on, so I'm going to be doing layer 4 inspection. The TCP app profile is what I'm using for TCP application uh, correlation. I've got the load balancer pool called, or this is what I'm calling this particular virtual server. Or I could actually, let me go ahead and delete this and just call this inline load balancer the IP address that I'm going to be receiving inbound connections on. And then the protocol that I'm going to be listening for and the port that goes alongside of that. And then the servers that are going to be responding to it. I'm going to go ahead and click on Add. And after a couple of moments, that should be live. We see that it's enabled. Now I'm going to come up here, back to this guy, hit the up arrow. right, And we can see nothing's really going on. But if we wanted to, we can definitely take a look at how this works. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go and kick off a connection. I'm going to bring up a new tab in Google Chrome. I'm going to go ahead and plug in. Let me go ahead and bring this down just a little bit. And I'll plug in here, 10.10.0.2. And after a couple of seconds, there it goes. It pops up. We come over here, hit the up arrow and we have an inbound connection, right? So 15 and 16 are both responding for that. If I go back over here and try that again, let's go ahead and open up a new tab, 10.10.0.2, it pops up, I hit the up arrow, and I have connections coming through. Now obviously they're already established. So I can actually come in here, let me go back over here to the hosting clusters, and I'm going to click on VM1. I'm going to launch remote console. And what I want to show you guys is if we look at the connection. Give this a second to log in. Let me go ahead and send control of delete here. Log in. What you're going to see. I want you guys to see this before I try to explain it. So the server's good to go. Let's give it a, a second or two to uh, get up to speed here. I haven't I didn't log into this ahead of time, but that's okay. I'm going to click on the command prompt. 
and I'm going to come in here and type in netstat dash NAO. And you can see right here that the IP address that is coming in, if I was to go ahead and mark this, right, you can see the there's an established connection from 172.29.11.1. 172.29.11.1 is the connection between the edge services gateway and the DLR. So if I was to draw this out real quick, what's happening is I have my client that is sending a request down to the edge services gateway on 10.10.0.2. The DLR and the edge services gateway have a connection. DLR is here, and then I have a logical switch and I have two servers. I have server one and server two. This connection here is 172.29.11.0 slash 24. This guy right here is supposed to be a four not a nine. This guy right here is dot one. This guy right here is dot two. I am from th from here I have a connection going out to this guy and a connection going out to this guy being sourced from the 172.29.11.1, which is how this guy right here is getting connected. That's why you see what you see, because of the fact that I'm coming from 11.1. .1. That is why you see that. So the Edge Services Gateway is opening up the connection on behalf of the client, which is why I'm not punching a hole through, and it's load balancing the connections. So it's giving it's load balancing across all the member servers and that's where the one armed load balancer feature comes in or, i'm sorry the inline load balancer service comes into play and that's essentially what we're trying to accomplish here which is working out quite well the service is working the way we expected it to so we will take a look at this in a little bit more detail in upcoming videos to talk about you know how the connection databases work and all that good stuff that goes along with it until next time, guys, thanks so much for stopping by, and I'll catch all of you in the next video.